Hi, and welcome to an episode of the Jet Rails podcast. I'm Robert Rand, your host. Uh, today, I'm joined by Ivona, who is going to be representing the team at Imagination Media. And we're going to be talking about uh, delivering seamless omni-channel experiences with Magento. And <laughs> I think we'll probably talk a little bit about uh, you know multi-channel versus unified commerce versus omni-channel. There's a lot of terms out there to describe pulling together different systems and, uh, and, and experiences uh, when it comes to the e-commerce world. Um, but with no further ado, uh, Ivona, would you introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. And hi, Robert. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me and obviously having us. And when I say us, uh, I mean Imagination Media. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, so, uh, my name is Ivona Namiesnik and I work as a marketing director here at Imagination Media. I have been here for, my God, it has been almost two years now. So it's quite some time. Um, and yeah, um, I, I primarily take care of our content and I work with our partners. Um, I... Uh, try to get a good grasp of the e-commerce industry and the new trends. So that way I'm able to assist our e-commerce consultants uh, on maybe what things should be implement and how we should approach certain projects. Yeah. And, and I know you've been in the Magento ecosystem for some time and uh, I, I didn't get to see you at, at uh, Magento Live EU this year. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot more time at, at the North American events lately, yeah. but um, but, but uh, you know, definitely uh, lots of insight for, from the industry. Um, and I should ask, because we have a lot of, of agency partners at JetRails mm -hmm. and um, a lot of companies differentiate in, in a lot of ways. How did mm -hmm. Imagination Media get started? Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, some, of, some of that background? Okay, so um, our CEO, Ali Ahmed, uh, started developing sites in, I think it was around 2010, but he has been working in IT for, I would say, a decade prior to that. And you know how these things go. Uh, he came across Magento when a friend of his asked, like, um, are you able to assist with this project? And since the platform was open source and had this amazing community, and, and I think that's one of the things we are still very drowned to uh, he fell in love with it and fast forward we are um we are now here we have almost 40 people which is i would say a pretty big number given the fact that we have been growing exponentially mostly in the last two or three years um one of the reasons why we have been growing so much, if uh, I can be very transparent here, is because sure. we have been building web shops on top of three different platforms, Magento, BigCommerce, and Salesforce, uh, because we have been really trying to um, provide our clients um, with a very unique solution. So uh, the focus is always on the need at the individual level. Um, we really believe in helping our partners grow, whether that's um, a client, an actual merchant, or a partner that's a technical vendor. And we are definitely not a marketing agency. We don't tout ourselves to be, um, but we do have a lot of individuals with years of combined e-commerce experience. And um, we have been able to specialize in helping um, merchants that primarily uh, sell uh, in retail and jewelry industries, uh, luxury line products to be very specific. Um, and I think that's what really helped us grow this way. So if we have to be very specific in terms of what uh, services we actually offer, that would be obviously helping clients define the strategy. And then we have design development and the integrations part, which I believe makes a huge difference. And the experience shows uh, the same. Yeah, I'm lucky enough. Uh, I'm based in South Florida where Imagination mm -hmm. Media is headquartered. I get to see Ali yeah. at Magento meetups and, and hang out all, all the time. And I remember he, he started in the earlier years connecting um, different uh, point of sale software and other software yes. with Magento when I think that was, those were some of his, his earlier projects that got him mm -hmm. hooked into the community. Yeah. Uh, I, I know your team now partners with, with Teamwork Retail. and Yes. 
that's still a, a big, um, mm -hmm. certainly a, a big part of things. So definitely a lot of history there that leads into that, that omni-channel exactly. uh, side of things. And <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that our history really made us uh, who we are now today. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why we have decided to cover the topic of omni-channel. It's just very natural for us. Yeah, so let's dive in on that. Um, what okay. does omnichannel mean in e-commerce these days? Uh, first of all, I will say that's a very, very good question. Um, I think that um, ever since that famous word digital swept across the world um, and it almost became synonymous with innovation, no matter how big is your company, um, you are in a race to digitize everything, you know. Um, and obviously clients are driven by the assumption that um, um, if we are increasingly digital, then um, we will be able to have um, or be financially superior, which is pretty correct, you know. Customers themselves are becoming increasingly digital. But from our experience, businesses really must strike that balance between physical and digital services. And it's very funny. Recently, I read a report from Harvard Business Review, if I'm not mistaken, that says uh, customer experience professionals, like the whole industry confirms, 84% agrees that that hybrid customer experience builds loyalty. And this is really where omni-channel comes into play. Um, omni-channel can mean so many different things to so many different people, uh, depending on the silo in which you operate in. Uh, and for me, that's pretty funny because that's exactly what omni-channel is going to destroy, siloed businesses. So um, linking online and in-store business is essential to staying competitive. But um, if we are going to define uh, omni-channel strategy, it's really a way to make the whole process of buying, um, returning items uh, very smooth. Yeah. And, you know, there are obviously a lot of major retailers that um, have been excelling at this and, and even more that have yeah. been failing at it. So, uh, it, it continues to be a big term every time I see a presentation from, you know, a, a group like Forrester on the topic. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are always these pain points that that uh, users have a hard time adopting. It's like it's it's on their list, it's on their to do, it's on their yeah. wish list for their organization, um, but they don't necessarily uh, get it quite right. Like the buy online, pick up in store mm -hmm. type of solutions that uh, you know that more of us wish were readily available uh, with, with more retailers. Um, you know, thinking think, about, uh, about that, well, yeah, uh, please. No, I, I just wanted to confirm what you were saying from our experience. Um, I think that a lot of brands, as you said, have that on the wish list, you know, like uh, it's really um, at this point, if you are a merchant, doesn't matter what you think you're capable of or what you are doing because it won't change customers' expectations. So I think it's very important to move um, omni-channel and unified commerce from a wish list to a to-do list. Yeah, you know, and sometimes uh, I wonder, I, I talk about brands like Costco mm -hmm. where you know, they have an online site, there's no mobile app, um, there's, uh, there's no ability to get most of the product that you'd find in a store for getting fresh produce or things like that. But even just regular, you know, shelf stable items mm -hmm. uh, that you can't order a lot of it on online. Um, you definitely you can't do, on you know, order online, pick up in store, there's so many levels to it where the returns are easy. Um, yep. by and large, but there's so much more to it that they don't live up to. And, and obviously that's a big retailer that, um, that has the resource mm -hmm. to invest into doing things better if, if they so chose. And, you know, sometimes you wonder how do they, how do they get to that point <laughs> of, uh, of not excelling? I agree. I agree. Um, so we all run into, uh, lots of examples of that and, and, you know, the real world where mm -hmm. it leaves us scratching our heads. And sometimes we see those businesses fail, um, I don't think Costco is one of those. They they thrive in their 
retail mm-hmm. locations. And um, I, I think that that's, that'll continue to be a differentiator for them. But, um, you know, let, let's shift gears a little bit and, and talk mm-hmm. about it um, as opposed to from the, the retailer side, from the, the tech stack side. How is okay. Magento uh, evolving to tackle some of the, these um, omni-channel needs and, and some, of these, some of the real demand for omni-channel mm-hmm. experience? Um, I think that, first of all, we would um, need to look at the platform itself and what is it able to offer. You know, um, obviously, with the rollout of Magento 2, we have seen um, a lot of Magento features evolve because, um, as I said, consumers expect certain things and the the platform itself had to adapt. So uh, we have... Uh, customer segmentation, we have content staging, we have instant purchase options, et cetera, et cetera. But now we also uh, see this other side, which enables seamless shopping everywhere. So when we are talking about omni-channel, we all, we really need to take into consideration things like mobile commerce, B2B commerce, uh, sales channels, um, various ERP integrations, um, what is uh, out there that is really enabling uh, your business to grow in terms of operations? So we are talking about uh, Magento 2 having business intelligence, uh, better shipping options, inventory management, um, all of these different things. And obviously Magento offering that's coming to play uh, really enables merchants to operate with confidence. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the B2B feature set um, that Magento Commerce is offering is really, you know, something interesting that until that became part of the official stack, uh, I think that that was one of the most um, common sets of integrations uh, into Magento, or, or maybe I shouldn't use the term integration on this particular topic, yeah. uh, but, but it, you know, it, it, sets of extensions or customizations that, that you'd run into. Um, and still is. I mean, I think a lot of those B2B businesses have custom rules that go above and beyond um, Absolutely. those native feature sets that those are maybe a good starting place. But, um, but, but that's certainly a big deal um, that one of the, the biggest arenas that Magento thrives in today is certainly B2B where, B2B. where you have more complex needs, um, you know, being able to seamlessly... Mm-hmm. Uh, serve up B2B and B2C from the same Magento installation is, is certainly a pleasure. Um, but you've also uh, um, you've also got things that they've added like for um, uh, the, uh, the, the the multi uh, warehouse okay. inventory yeah, location inventory. being able to to handle that for for some of these mm-hmm. folks so they can actually natively um, count in inventory for different locations, which, you know, definitely helps get mm-hmm. people a lot closer, a lot more easily to that buy online, pick up and store. Cause you can actually have Magento know how much inventory you've got in a particular location. In a particular, so yes. It's, it's interesting how different some of these things can be, um, whether you're talking retail or, or wholesale or distribution or whatever other, uh, you, you know, types of needs get filled. Um, Obviously, we, we started talking off about uh, talking about how your team, uh, you know, has has a long history with connecting other software systems. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, Magento certainly has uh, has a strong open API. Um, not the only platform to boast that these days. Although I, I'd say more flexibility in that API in certain arenas, including yeah. when it comes to things like the checkout. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I, I suppose you're probably seeing some of that as well, that, uh, that that Magento is being leveraged more often for more of those unique use cases and even connecting in completely separate systems, uh, connecting in orders and checkouts and things of that nature. Um, from our experience, clients are very drawn to Magento because of its flexibility in every aspect. It's not only checkout, it's um, the the options and uh, that you can create pretty much anything. You can customize the customer journey in whatever way you want. And it's very funny when you have been talking about that B2B uh, and B2C differences and um, the way um, what we, you can do actually to create them. Uh, I was really thinking on about one of our clients 
uh, called Montana Silversmiths. Uh, they produce um, things which are beyond a stock product and really leveraging Magento to commerce to develop their product builder platform uh, meant that the, the end consumer is uh, able to c customize their products for their own style, for events, for awards, for uh, rewards, for recognitions. And um, the thing that happened eventually is that we have expanded that same experience into their B2B environment, which basically allows resellers to control how customized products are built for their consumers. So, um, that means that their B2B channels are able to expand uh, on-site personalization uh, for all of these different rodeo and show events. And for the end consumer, that really means that um, you are able to get your product way faster with less friction. And I think that's the goal for every agency, you know, like really helping the merchant to deliver their product faster in a better way, in a seamless way, uh, with a clear understanding what is the value behind it. Absolutely. And, you know, there are some phenomenal SaaS solutions and integrations to Magento that are available off the shelf from, from best in class mm -hmm. companies. But there are also things for those Magento commerce users like um, Magento order management that yes. you can leverage mm -hmm. side by side with, with Magento um, as part of your stack. And so I, I think it is nice that Magento users have choice, um, that it is still that, that open ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that they're really refined systems uh, that can, I, I'd say almost, you know, be used to their full ex extent because they're not limited, yeah. particularly by the platform, where in some cases, even if, if there's a particular system, you know, that can connect with platform X, um, it, you can't always leverage it to the best of your ability. So, for instance, if you're connecting QuickBooks with something, um, you know, that doesn't always mean that you're getting uh, full customization capability, the ability to really address every business rule or need. Um, you know, sometimes there are more limiting factors. Um, and, you know, so speaking about... Um, really manifest destiny when it comes to customization. I know that in the last couple of years, um, progressive web apps, PWAs, mm -hmm. uh, have been taking center stage in a lot of conversations. Certainly, I like that plays phrase. a role in omni channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're definitely right. Center stage is the right phrase. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your take on? Uh, progressive web apps and the value that they're bringing. And, you know, it's, it's nice that, you know, PWA Studio, not that long ago, they released version, I believe, 5.0. Mm -hmm. And so it's progressing. Um, it's still, I would still consider it early days in terms of, you know, yes, there's going to be some additional, um, some additional dev work to really mm -hmm. leverage it, but you can, you know, you can do some really cool stuff and, um, you know, and, and I think that's what Magento users are looking for. They're looking to be cutting edge uh, when they can. That you know, they, they won't always. Not everyone's going to be an early adopter to everything, um, but they're they're looking for ways that they can beat Amazon, that they can differentiate, yeah. that they can uh, they can um, win out. What what are you seeing in the PWA space? Okay, well, let me first answer about the PWA and then remind me to get back to that Amazon uh, thing. Sure. <laughs> um, I think that. If we are going to go strictly from uh, what's the definition of PWA, um, it sounds very fancy. You know, it's, um, I think the phrase was suit of online tools that provide mobile like experiences or something like that. You know, it, um, I like how ambiguous it is um, because. Uh, it promises a lot, but I, as you said, I think we are still um, we are still in the early adopter phase. Um, I think that the general idea is beautiful, uh, not only for merchants. It is very interesting for agencies as well because we are all trying to figure out how to deliver that very personalized cross-channel experiences, and PWAs are perfect for that. Uh, the, the impact of PWA in 
theory, obviously, goes beyond mobile. And um, I am sure a lot of listeners are very familiar with what BWAs um, are able to do, but let's just quickly recap and say we are talking push notifications, we are talking locations being built into the architecture, um, we are talking about um, that personalization, like precisely the right time, um, precisely the right place. And it is all obviously uh, for a much lesser price than you would have if you were building a mobile app. Um, have we seen um, a lot of people actually implementing it? Um, I have seen a lot of interest in like people getting hmm. to implement it. And I think that's a big difference. Um, I think that... Um, Maybe this will sound political, but uh, smart people are really still trying to weigh in and it is not easy for everybody to be that early adopter. You know, like not everybody is able to afford that. Um, while PWA definitely can change the playing field, um, I think that I somewhere read um, that it can, in an ideal world, or maybe we will see in six months, we, we still don't know, um, it has a potential to replace legacy POS systems, um, make retail associates um, completely, um, well, almost completely not, not necessary. Um, but I don't think a lot of people actually wants to make that first step and rightfully so, you know, like we have a lot of expectations and because of that expectations, um, people don't want to go out there, invest a whole lot of money and then don't get what they were promised, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's come up more consistently in the Magento community because there's still so many Magento one users out there yeah. that are looking at Magento two. And if you're looking at replatforming, deciding whether you want to use, you know, a more traditional front end Magento theme, um, or whether you want to build out a progressive web app for your front end. I think that that's a natural conversation to have at this Absolutely. point. And so, you know, there are still, you know, there's that breakdown and I, I wish I had it on a graph to, you know, or some kind of a chart to see mm -hmm. how, how many are actually choosing PWA at this point. Um, at, at JetRails, we're certainly, um, you know, seeing, you know, seeing interest there as well and more, probably more conversations than activity. Um, but, but we're seeing some cool stuff. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to be able to give that fast mobile experience without needing someone to first go to, you know, the, to the, you know, an, an Apple or, or, or Google mm -hmm. um, app to download an app uh, yeah. for the retailer or wholesaler, what have you. And I think that that's, you know, that there's certainly value to, um, to the loading speed and other benefits to some of the unique user experiences that get delivered. But absolutely, you know, it's, it's more work. Um, there are, there are considerations uh, yeah. and, when you look at, at something like this, um, you know, I, I think the other interesting thing is that, so PWA Studio is open to all Magento 2 users, um, you know, on, on any of the, the up-to-date versions of Magento, right? any of these Magento 2.3 users, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, any developer can start to dive in on, on that, um, that it's... You know, there are features that Magento offers, like Magento order management that you have to subscribe to. And this one is, like much of Magento, very much democratized. And so I mm -hmm. think that, at least from a development perspective, that we'll continue to see yeah. the market. Um, I always find that, that these things that are open to the largest swath, uh, swath of the market, um, that they evolve more quickly in more interesting ways to support, you know, wider user base. And that, there's a lot of that's the power of Magento. It's the user base. It's being mm -hmm. able to support uh, folks in different growth phases. So yeah. it's a very interesting, uh, interesting part of the industry. And I, you know, I want to be able to equate it to when businesses started to um, started to build sites that were mobile responsive, um, because before that you know, maybe you had no mobile site or you had a separate mobile site that loaded at m dot, whatever your domain mm -hmm. was, dot com or 
or your domain.com forward slash M or something like that. Uh, and then folks started to, you know, go mobile responsive. Typically, it, it might have increased the, <laughs> the launch bill a little bit. There was more uh, cross-browser testing to be done. There was more work to make images and things work at different sizes and change elements and more touch up. And so it, it maybe it, it added to some complexity for a while there until it just became the gold standard. But uh, at the same time, it's where things went. And I'd like to think that as progressive web apps become more, uh, you know, or faster and easier to launch and um, as things come along, that it, it will become a standard of its own. But um, I try not to predict too many things. It doesn't, it doesn't usually work out all that well. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's very important to just listen to the client and what it is exactly that they need. Uh, if we are talking PWAs, uh, if we are talking uh, any of the other things that are currently affecting e-commerce industry, uh, we can predict whatever we want, but ultimately, um, it's not about what we predict, but what the reality is. You know, like what it is that clients are telling us that they need, what they want to invest in. Our job is to make their lives easier. And for them, that that can obviously is affected by technology. So we are here specifically talking Magento and what Magento has to offer. Um, but there are so many other things that are at play, you know, and I think um, really building that whole picture and looking and um, what other factor, factors are influencing um, enables for a very good omni-channel strategy. So it's not only about one specific technology, but all of these different things that come into play and really enable their end consumer to have a seamless experience from point A to point B. And I know that we wanted to come back to Amazon. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I really wanted to say that... Um, Mentioning Amazon is um, a very interesting uh, thing in a conversation like this because Amazon uh, really sets the standard for a lot of stuff, whether that's shipping, delivery, um, what customers expect. Uh, I somewhere read that um, I think 60 or 70% of Americans go to Amazon before they go anywhere else to check what the prices are like, which is so ridiculous you know it's like uh, we don't say uh, and I, I will draw a parallel here we don't say oh I went to search something I say I googled something so the brand actually became a verb you know and I think um, maybe that's slowly happen happening here but why is it interesting that there is Amazon on one side and uh, I think when we are talking about omnichannel the other smaller brands, because not everybody is the size of Amazon, obviously, being on the other side really helps you humanize the brand. And that's what this new wave of customers really expects. That's one of the perks of Omnichannel. You are able to communicate your values better. You're able to communicate what you stand for. You are really able to provide them with that customized journey. Oh, hi, you looked at this. This is what you are interested in. You bought this. You um, Maybe you would like this. You want to return this in a store. Sure, it's not a problem at all. But for that to happen, you really have to remove all of these different barriers, all of these different silos, all of these different data points, I would say, that are not communicating with each other. Because if you have all of these barriers, you are not able to make an informed decision about what is actually going to help your customer. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that we talk about... Um, and I know we, I opened up mentioning this uh, omni-channel, unified mm -hmm. commerce, multi-channel, um, that, you know, I, I've always looked at multi-channel as, as just, you know, just that, that there are multiple channels of different sorts in yeah. some cases and they're interconnected. Uh, when it, do you think of unified commerce any differently than omni-channel when uh -huh. someone speaks about it? 
Yeah, definitely. I think that there is a huge difference between um, uh, multi-channel, omni-channel, unified commerce and um, or unified retail, uh, depending on the article, I think. Hmm. Uh, I, from what I've read, there is obviously there is always this next big thing, you know, probably in six months or a year, unified commerce is going to be obsolete because we are just going to be talking commerce. And I don't want to talk about predictions, but the way customers are and the standard of what they expect, it's just, it doesn't make sense to talk about channels anymore. And I think that's what unified commerce is really about. So, um, I think unified commerce from our experience is really taking the omni-channel experience much further. So you have, as I said, all of these disconnected IT systems that um, they are in place, but they are not actually communicating with each other. So unified commerce really takes them into one single centralized platform. And that platform means e-commerce, m-commerce, mm-hmm. mobile commerce, um, order fulfillment, inventory management, um, customer relationship management, all of these different technologies. And when you integrate them all into one single platform, like companies can really um, get rid of all of these internal channels that are operating in their own silos. So um, as I said, they're removing their, their own barriers and really helping them make better more informed decisions. Yeah, it cuts down on friction. And, uh, yeah. you know, in some cases, when you're interconnecting systems, these are not systems that are built specifically with that integration in mind, right? So, yeah. you know, so inevitably, you're moving certain data points as best as you can. Sometimes you're customizing systems on either or both ends to, to handle even more. Um, I'd say, you know, th- there are still some uh, some examples you probably could, you know, could, could throw out some, some as well of uh, experiences that are harder to deliver in, in this interconnected and in, interwoven, um, you know, t- type of a landscape. Um, I know that uh, when you're talking about retailers, um, there are things that you can have online or in store that because you're usually dealing with a separate e-commerce system, a separate point of sale software in, in the stores, mm-hmm. Um, that, that gets a little dicey, uh, like gift cards and reward points. Um, yeah. You know, I've, you probably <laughs> come across some some other challenges as well. I know we talked a little bit about buy online, pick up in store. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it, I think that um, it, uh, every retailer is coming across um, – their own unique and specific set of challenges. But when we are talking unified commerce, I think that unified commerce is really able to address most of them. Um, From our experience, um, the challenges that people usually come across is, as we mentioned, buy online, pick up in store. Then we have cross-channel returns. I would also say uh, reward points and gift cards because Um, reward points and gift cards, they are not very tangible, you know, like you can't go into a store and say, oh, this is the shirt, you know, Uh, that's it. So uh, certain um, retailers have challenges with that, but uh, a proper omni-channel strategy really, um, really helps solve that. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the the technical aspects of servicing the customer somewhere, um, Mm -hmm. you know, whether they're standing in a store and now you can basically unify everything on some sort of a a tablet or screen, whether, um, you know, (laughs) some sort of kiosk or internet of things experience, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, across different uh, mobile and and desktop experiences. And um, what, um, you know, what I think we we didn't touch on, which is certainly a big topic in Mm multi-channel, is marketing. Um, because mm-hmm. if you were to search even in, let's say, Magento's marketplace, you would see and search multi-channel um, or omni-channel, mm-hmm. I, I would expect that you'd start to see um, some companies w- with uh, familiar stacks that are going to help deliver marketing messaging through different channels. And, and that can be just as important in the same way that with multi-channel, when it comes to integration, um, you know, whether you're integrating your 
inventory and orders with marketplaces or um, with uh, drop shippers or, you know, there's, there's almost, um, that's the beauty of these systems that there's, there's almost infinite possibilities of how you're going to pull things together. Um, but um, in, in terms of, of marketing, um, have you found that, that that's a major topic that, that your team gets asked about integrating different, uh, different systems or, or delivering those sorts of experiences offsite? <laughs> Um, I think that um, from our experience, retailers are really interested in creating those touch points um, across different channels. So um, because customer, the end customer or shopper, they expect um, the same level of communication, the same level of quality, whether they are uh, landing on your Facebook or Instagram page or they are landing on the website. And that integration part is extremely important. When I think of one of our clients, um, Cadbird, I'm really thinking about how strong their social game is, so to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really is breaking down um, international barriers. That's what really um, enabled um, them to really think about what improvements they specifically need to make to their experience. Uh, for example, um, we have created omni-channel modules for the same-day shipping, for in-store pickup, for um, um, actually buying from those social media channels, where um, that's what's driving their growth. And um, it's almost... 40% higher year on year. Like their sales are, um, their sales are driven by those specific models that we have built. Um, and I don't think that would be possible if we understand, if we understood, sorry, uh, the full scope of the journey that the shopper is going through. Um, Cadbury in those terms is obviously a very specific brand because they stand for so many things. They have this very highly curated, crafted, uh, beautiful rings, well, jewelry in general. But the whole experience needed to reflect that. And if you don't have um, certain things in place, for example, communicating with your uh, shoppers in the right way, in a way that reflects what you stand for, uh, people are going to get disappointed. And I think we have to be very honest about this. Customers have expectations. And whether you are able to meet them or not, as I said previously, does not matter. Their expectations will not change mm. because they are benchmarking you against very big players. Well, and I think to that point that it's become more difficult to be... And I think it's it's a challenge. It's not uh, it's not nearly impossible to solve for for merchants today. But it's become harder to be where the customer is consistently yes. because the customer <laughs> is not in you know the customer right you know air quotes is not yeah. in one place. So uh, a lot of us were sitting at one of the keynotes at Magento Imagine mm -hmm. uh, th this past year. Um, Gary V was talking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to, to the crowd asking questions about, so, you know, how, uh, to boil it down, how many of you actually sit through TV commercials? And given that so many of us um, subscribe to some sort of streaming, you know, mm -hmm. where we don't have commercials or have some sort of a, you know, TiVo style product, some kind of a DVR um, where we can record and fast forward through commercials or what have you. So, you know, e even if you are wa still watching something on a, a physical television, you know, uh, are you really consuming the advertising? Um, and well, you know, so companies, let's say, I don't know, you know, car, car brands that have thrived on some of those commercials, well, you know, they've got to rethink that strategy and they've got to be in different places. Um, I, I think that there are similar effects, different industries, um, you know, some businesses started yeah. online first, you know, aren't necessarily tied to some, you know, legacy marketing and media, but nonetheless, you know, that things are constantly evolving. So now, you you know, you can, as things popped up where you could sell directly through Instagram or 
You know, mm-hmm. people don't necessarily have the best open rates to their emails in all cases, but they might be much more likely to open and react to a text message to an SMS. Um, um, th- this maybe is going to come from the marketing side of me. <laughs> so um, I think that customers today are not interested in purely in 5, 15, 20% off. They are also very interested in the stories and the values. Um, and I think maybe the profile of the customer, um, customers now are smarter. They take their time to investigate certain things. It was very interesting. I think um, around February, we went to dig a little bit deeper into what it is that customers want. And we discovered it was inspired by one of the books uh, our marketing team read. It was five love languages of uh, your customers. And we really boiled it down to um, there are different profiles of customers and they expect certain things. So there are customers that expect 15% off. There are customers that are really interested in your story and then they don't mind paying more. Um, If you stand, for example, for recycled products, you are giving $1 for every $3 that they spend or certain things like that. Then there are customers that really want to have... um, I don't know, gifts for their birthday or uh, et cetera, et cetera, like uh, all of these different things. And if you understand what your specific customer, like what is their love language, quote unquote. Yeah, they're customers uh, that just want, you know, like for free two day shipping. And exactly. That's what they're exactly. looking for, even if somehow or other, it'd call, you know, free returns. Um, yes. Certainly companies yeah. like Zappos have done well with, uh, but with things like that, um, I, I'm with you. Figure out how to speak to different personas. Don't. Yes. So one of my favorite pieces of advice that someone gave me years and years and years ago when I first got into the industry, feels like mm-hmm. a lifetime, um, <laughs> was, and perhaps it's because they went on a shopping trip with me and they <laughs> learned that that probably, you know, I'm not the biggest shopper out okay. there. Let's just put it okay. politely. Uh, <laughs> Robert, don't use yourself as a barometer. <laughs> it's because you wouldn't react to that advertising or you wouldn't mm-hmm. react to that offer or whatever else it may be it doesn't mean that there isn't a segment of customers that would. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of test and measure. Um, I know that, uh, you know, that there are certainly, you know, even in some cases in A-B testing or in personalization, I know that a, a lot of Magento users in the last couple of years have been um, involved with uh, mobile optimization initiative with yeah. uh, high conversion and PayPal and mm-hmm. um, you know high conversion has a, a lot of those tools as do, as do some other great companies in mm-hmm. in the space um, to be able to to test out even some of that on site messaging um, to get it right with the customer um, to figure out you know what's going to motivate that customer to buy um, but but for sure you know I, I don't think that you can just run the same ads for everyone. Um, send the same messaging for everyone and uh, assume that that's the best way forward. I think at this point, segmentation, automation, um, letting AI and machine learning figure out which campaigns, which users are going to react to and meeting them halfway at least. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's part of the puzzle um, that, uh, you know, especially as as you grow, especially as you hit certain customer sizes Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you've got 100,000 email subscribers and you're still using that that starter email marketing platform and you're not leveraging uh, a multi-channel marketing platform that can really leverage the data better, I think that, uh, you know, just like anything else, um, that, and I think that some of these technologies, they're continuing to filter down market to become more and more mm-hmm. accessible to more merchants. Yeah, uh, that there's a lot of that happening that, um, you know, if the consumer just wanted it cheaper and I, I don't want to be a broken record with it, but they could uh, they, they can probably go to Amazon for that. I'll yeah. I'll use uh, a real life case, um, you know, that I'll, I'll admit um, I was not particularly uh, stocked up on hand sanitizer and. I, you know, have a four-year-old, and so okay. there's a lot of drop-off and pickup from 
uh, from preschool and I've, mm-hmm. I've got a newborn who's now eight weeks old. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we're trying to be reasonable where yeah. I'm not stockpiling, um, you know, hand sanitizer here. Don't, don't come looking. <laughs> but, um, I promise I won't. Yeah. Okay, but I, I can't really tell uh, somewhere like Amazon w- what to trust in terms of the sellers. And there's a lot of gouging yeah. and there's a lot of other nonsense going on. And so rather than deal with that, I went shopping, you know, with, um, you know, p- picked a medical supply company that sold retail yeah. that I've never ordered from before. Um, but you know, <laughs> you'd like to hope that based on who I am and what I do all day, that, that I want to support, um, smaller business, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and work like that. And I saw that they had some products sold out and that made me feel like they were managing their inventory. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I had a, a good shot that what they were offering, uh, you know, did have some, some real availability. And so that's, that's a route that I took. Um, and I absolutely looked at their reviews and certain other things that, that you would hope that I would, um, mm-hmm. before choosing, but it didn't take me all that long. <laughs> and, um, and that's what, what it's supposed to be that we're supposed to be able to go and find a retailer or a wholesaler in some cases that, that we can, um, feel good about placing that, that order and that are going to address the concerns that we have in the moment. Exactly. Um, and, and that's all, you know, part and parcel of, of earning new customers. And obviously I'm now on their email list and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a new source for, for certain things for me. Yeah. And I think, um, you made a very, very good point there. Um, when we are shopping for something, it really depends what the end goal is. Uh, if you wanted to get it at the lowest price possible, you're probably not going somewhere that stays, uh, let's say, um, recycled, no this, no that. It's basically air in a bag uh, because um, those prices will be higher and rightfully so. Uh, If you're looking for the cheapest option, as you said, you probably go to Amazon. But if you really want something that stands for certain values, then you go to a specific brand, like maybe medical company that is selling hand sanitizer really builds the trust that you need because you have two kids at home and you really have to feel safe about the product that you're buying, which is completely okay. You, You just have a different starting point, so to say, than the some other customer and understanding what that customer really needs is the key for every merchant. And when you were talking about the best advice that you got, uh, I'm primarily a marketing girl. I never liked statistics, math, all of that stuff. It wasn't very fun for me, you know? And when I thought about marketing, when I was in college, I was like, Oh, marketing is just creating stories, you know? But what I learned along the way and what one of my mentors back in the past told me is that you have to start taking data seriously. And if you are not gathering data, then you already have a problem, you know? So um, I think when you get that data, you are really able to understand what your customer really wants. How are they going through your site? What is their decision-making process? And then you are able to uh, optimize, basically. That, that's when all of these little small tweaks come into play and you are, let's say, changing the color of the buttons to see what they are really, like what's the trigger for them or you are opting for green rather than red or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think we've really done a pretty good job of covering yeah. uh, a, lot of, a lot of vague terms and, yeah. tr- and trying to, you know, trying to shed some light on them. Um, yeah. before we, we wrap up, any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I would like to say that, um, based on your role in, in the company, if you are interested in, um, in omni-channel unified commerce, um, I would say that there are a few steps that you can now take. Literally, you don't need anybody else, just you and your team. Um, first of all, I would say, um, review your current technology and make sure that it's speaking to one another. If it's not speaking to one another, really look at the steps to make that changes. Um, before you start investing into anything else, into any new platform, you really need to understand the potential impact on your other operational areas. 
Um, second thing that I would do if I were in that place is I would get one of your design teams or whoever is in charge of that specific uh, area to audit your current customer experience. Um, if you want a unifying experience across your business, then you have to understand what those, those experiences are. Third thing, looking at the data, as I said, you really want to analyze to be able to leverage those insights. And then at the end, you need to have a certain technological foundation. Is what you currently have what you really need? And if it's not, what would be the best way to go? And I'm not saying that at this point, you need to make certain changes, but I think that every company has certain objectives, certain goals that they are trying to hit. Um, at the end, it's very important that you are hitting those goals if those goals align with what your customers want. You don't have to listen to not necessarily me, you, any technology vendor, you know, like listen to your customers. They will always tell you what it is that they expect out of you. Uh, what is really that hybrid customer experience, what it means for them, because as we said, every customer is different. So balancing that technology investments um, to ensure the consistent quality, I would say that's, that's the key. Awesome. Um, well, you know, and, and I don't think I could have said it any, any better myself. Thank you. Uh, I really flattered. appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you know, we... There are so many ways of, of looking at, at these things. I, I do agree that I, I think uh, a lot of it does come from pulling the right stakeholders together, yeah. um, having the right voices within your company and from within your, your vendors and partners that are going to be talking to you about your marketing um, aspects and your customer experience aspects and your back of the house uh, factors that, that are going to really impact your business when it comes to things like fulfillment and customer support. And there's infinite possibilities. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think it's often just making sure uh, to start off by including the, the right folks, having good yeah. consultants, having having good, uh, yeah. good people that creating. understand a lot of those options to help guide you. Yeah, make sure that um, whatever it is that you're doing, you're not creating more division inside the company. Like <laughs> the goal here is to unify everyone behind a single vision and transfer that onto the customer experience. Absolutely. It's like, you know, you, you, even so you pull all the people I mentioned together and you leave out the merchandisers. And now, yeah. you know, how are you getting the product data correctly for the right channels you want to sell for yeah. there, there, there's just a lot of stakeholders to absolutely you know you can't have everything be you know a, a meeting with 20 decision makers but you definitely need stakeholders at the table yeah. um and so it, this has been uh, a pleasure as always um, thank, thank you. you so much for, you. for joining pleasure today. is all mine uh and to our listeners uh, thank you as always for for tuning in for listening or watching um please feel free to subscribe uh, wherever you watch uh, videos online um, or you know, wherever uh, you listen to find podcasts like this one. And, um, you know, we, we wish you much success. And if you're looking for updates um, as new materials and, and uh, episodes are coming out, you can follow Jet Rails on LinkedIn, on Twitter or Facebook. Um, we appreciate you and happy selling. <laughs>